Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Bonus episode, Anchors Away, the Seleucid Anchor and Imperial Iconography. Traditionally, the Seleucid Empire has never been categorized as a major maritime power, akin to classical Athens or contemporary Ptolemaic Egypt. It is an unusual stance in retrospect, when you consider that the borders of their empire included much of the eastern Mediterranean, the Persian Gulf, and the Indian Ocean. While archaeological evidence points to the sponsorship of extensive naval activity, most accounts, both ancient and modern, tend to fixate on imagery that is land-based, such as elephants. Yet of the many symbols that could be chosen to represent the imperial power of their dynasty, the Seleucids consistently relied on one above all others, the anchor. It was stamped on coins, weights, and seals as markers of their authority, and was also employed in the architecture and decorations adorning buildings across the empire. But why was it so ubiquitous among the Syrian kings? And how did it become this way? To find its origins, we need to return to the time of the dynasty's founder, Seleucus I Nicator. His ancestral homeland of Macedonia never possessed a powerful navy, as the Argead kings could not afford a fleet rivaling anywhere near the likes of Athens of the Persian Empire. The role of the navy was important in the beginning and ending stages of the campaigns of Alexander, but the emphasis on sea power did not come into play until after Alexander's death in the subsequent wars of the successors. It is during this period that Seleucus moves from a shadowy background character to an important player, claiming the title of king after retaking the city of Babylon in 312 or 311 BC, the effective foundation date of his family's empire. Accounts of Seleucus's early life and assumption of the title of king in Babylon are deeply interwoven with the adoption of the imperial anchor, and there are two main extant sources which we can investigate, that of Appian of Alexandria, a Greek historian during the 2nd century AD, and that of Pompeius Trogus, a Gallo-Roman author who wrote a universal history during the 1st century AD that was condensed by an author named Justin during the 4th century. Though they were writing 500 years after Seleucus's death, modern scholars have reasonably argued that each author was relying on the same sources, such as Hieronymus of Cardia, a contemporary of Seleucus who wrote a reliable account of the wars for Alexander's empire. Along with a typical recounting of Seleucus's battles and deeds, there are also a number of omens that are said to have appeared throughout Seleucus's life as hints of his imperial ambitions. But these feel less like historical observations and more like embellished court propaganda or folk tales written long after the fact. The earliest instance is tied to the story of his conception and birth, which involved his mother Laodike and a tryst with the god Apollo, the patron deity of the Seleucid dynasty. In Book 15, Justin relays to us the most detailed version. Quote, His mother, Laodike, being married to Antiochus, a man of eminence among Philip's generals, seemed to herself, in a dream, to have conceived from a union with Apollo, and, after becoming pregnant, to have received from him, as a reward for her compliance, a ring, on the stone of which was engraved an anchor, and which she was desired to give to the child that she did bring forth a ring similarly engraved, which was found the next day in the bed, and the figure of an anchor, which was visible on the thigh of Seleucus when he was born, made this dream extremely remarkable. This ring Laodike gave to Seleucus, when he was going with Alexander to the Persian War, informing him, at the same time, of his paternity. This mark of his paternity continued also among his descendants, for his sons and grandsons had an anchor on their thigh, as a natural proof of their extraction. End quote. By comparison, Appian's account is more brief, but contains some additional elements. Quote, His mother saw in a dream that whatever ring she found, she should give him to wear, and that he should be king at the place where he should lose the ring. She did find an iron ring with an anchor engraved on it, and he lost it near the Euphrates. End quote. In both stories, the anchor is explicitly portrayed as a marker of kingship. Unusual birthmarks or blemishes used as proof of royal ancestry are a common trope in storytelling, and though Apollo's sphere of influence has very little to do with the sea or sailing, it is clear that the anchor is an extension of the Seleucid ties to the god, 
as both a patron deity and a divine ancestor. In a literal sense, the engraved anchor on the ring effectively makes it into a signet ring, carrying a coat of arms that could be used as a means of identification, such as on wax sealed letters. As Appian explains, even the loss of the ring to the waters of the Euphrates was linked to Seleucus' early career. The Euphrates and Tigris rivers were the keys to the prosperity of Mesopotamia for countless millennia, as they provided the necessary resources to foster agriculture and the rise of powerful kingdoms, including the city of Babylon. As the greatest city of the Near East, Babylon played a significant role in the rise of the Seleucid dynasty. Seleucus received its governorship as a reward for his role in Perdiccas's murder in 319, and the date of his triumphant return to the city after he had been driven out by Antigonus the One-Eyed, approximately 312-311, was retroactively made into the foundation date of his dynasty and the start of the Seleucid era. Seleucus's connection with Babylonia, and by extension the rest of Asia, is repeatedly emphasized during the more mythical episodes of his life story. For instance, prior to setting out for Alexander's invasion of the Persian Empire, the Didymian oracle told him, quote, Not to hurry back to Europe. Asia will be much better for you. End quote. Such a declaration would make sense in retrospect, since Seleucus was murdered before he could take the throne of Macedonia in 281. With the loss of the ring into the waters of the Euphrates, the Seleucid dynasty was thus anchored to Asia, never to fully carry out their conquest of Macedonia and the rest of Greece. Given the frequency of the anchor's appearance, scholars have wondered where this tradition originated, and the answer might be found in the so-called Seleucus Romance. As the name implies, this is a work centered around the life of Seleucus I. But rather than being a strict historical account, the romance is heavily embellished with mythical storytelling. A good comparison would be the Alexander Romance, a retelling of the life of Alexander the Great containing episodic descriptions of battles with sea monsters, divine intervention, among many other fantastical legends. The concept of the Seleucus Romance is a modern one, a hypothetical work based upon consistent elements of Seleucid foundation myths preserved by later authors who otherwise do not name it directly. The date of its composition is debated, but the earliest known reference is tied to Euphorion of Chalkis, a poet and head librarian of King Antiochus III in the late 3rd century BC. According to a passage of the Roman author Tertullian, Euphorion appears to have written about the origins of the Seleucid dynasty. Quote, Seleucus's mother, Laodice, foresaw that he would rule over Asia even before she had given birth to him. Euphorion broadcast the fact. End quote. Though only the briefest of summaries, the elements of Euphorion's tale are clearly present and line up with the works of Appian and Pompeius Trogus nearly two centuries later. It is unclear whether Euphorion was the inventor of at least some of these traditions, or the original author of the Seleucus Romance, but Antiochus III was a particularly active patron of the arts. Much of his early reign was focused on restoring the fortunes of his empire, and sponsoring the creation of a dynastic epic would certainly help legitimize his claims over Asia which could have included the compilation of myths that were already present to some extent. Considering the narrative emphasis of the Seleucids being advised to stay in Asia by oracles and prophecies, it may have also served as a way to cover up Antiochus' defeat by the Roman Republic when he pursued his own conquests in Europe. Is there perhaps a more mundane explanation for the use of the anchor? As it turns out, Appian also provides a slightly different version of the ring story. Quote, it is said also that, at a later period, when Seleucus was setting out for Babylon, he stumbled against a stone which, when dug up, was seen to be an anchor. When the soothsayers were alarmed at this prodigy, thinking that it pretended to lay, Ptolemy, the son of Lagus, who accompanied the expedition, said that an anchor was a sign of safety, not of delay. And for this reason, Seleucus, when he became king, used an engraved anchor for his signet ring. End quote. Here we again see the repetition between the anchor, the ring, Babylon, and Seleucus's kingship. The role of the future Ptolemy I Soter of Egypt is also interesting, for although the Seleucid and Ptolemaic houses were bitter rivals throughout most of their history, the two founders were allies against the Antigonids and on good terms with each other until their dispute over the spoils of Ipsus. 
What is important to note is that after he was received by the Egyptian court following his flight from Babylonia in 315, Seleucus took part in the anti-Antigone coalition, serving as the admiral for Ptolemy's navy. This may be the anchor's true origin, for it is not difficult to imagine that Seleucus would use the anchor as a seal as part of his official capacity for Ptolemy, and simply continue to do so after he retook Babylon for his own. Yet it seems odd that Seleucus and his successors would choose to keep an image that would imply a subordinate status to Ptolemy, especially after their following out over the fate of Coily Syria in 301 BC. Still, having a few court poets on the payroll can do wonders for public relations, and both options may be the correct answer. In either case, the Seleucid anchor makes its first appearance shortly after his proclamation as king. Like his contemporaries, Seleucus struck coins that followed Alexander's use of the god Heracles, but distinguished his with the appearance of the anchor. Later strikes in his reign would have the anchor take place front and center on the reverse side of his coins, and the image appears on the design of his successors in similarly prominent positions as well. With regards to administration, the anchor is present on clay seals used for documents and goods to represent the authority of the king. These even apply when dealing with subordinate officials. Though allowed to retain the title of king by Antiochus III, there are coins minted by Euthydemus I of Bactria with the anchor stamped upon them, evidence of his submission to Seleucid authority. The association between anchor and imperial power persisted long after the final Seleucid king was deposed, making appearances in opposite ends of the former empire. In Judea, both the Hasmonean and Herodian dynasties depicted the anchor on their coins, despite the hostilities that led to the Maccabean revolt. Among the architectural decorations of Old Nisa, a Parthian settlement near the capital of Ashgabat in Turkmenistan, mitops, plates used as placeholders for decorations between columns, can be found with the carving of the Seleucid anchor, likely adopted by the ruling Arsakids as a general representation of kingship for a Hellenistic audience.